Hi everyone, my name is Mark Weber from the MIT IBM Watson AI Lab. We're a community of scientists from MIT and IBM Research. We conduct core AI research and publish our work in the top technical AI conferences and venues. I play a hybrid role at the lab, conducting some applied research, which I'll share with you today, but mainly leading our business program where we work with member companies and strategic partners from around the world to bridge our core algorithms to real impact in business and society. Today, I'll be sharing with you our work on graph deep learning, which is led by my colleagues Charles Leiserson at MIT, uh, Jia Chen, and Toyo Taro Suzumara from uh, IBM Research. And this is a, a line of work fo focused on accelerated and explainable graph deep learning for real world applications. We have a lot to cover today, uh, so I'll jump right into it. We're going to look at graph convolutional networks as a model architecture. We're going to look at a use case in anti-money laundering, and then we're going to consider uh, finally some, some of our most recent work uh, dealing with evolutionary dynamism, so graphs that are always changing. So first let's talk about graphs. Imagine trying to reason about something without any context. It's possible, but your understanding will be lim limited and brittle. That's because relationships between things give us critical information. What's more is that in complex systems, these relationships are always changing. The graphs are always growing. So in mathematics, we can model relational data as graph or as network structures. We have nodes representing entities or instances, edges mapping the relationships between them, and properties characterizing each. You can think about your social network, a supply chain network, uh, a knowledge graph of Wikipedia, or, uh, in times of social distancing, the network of interactions where a pandemic throughout which a pandemic might spread. So graphs are really everywhere, but most deep learning to date has really been on Euclidean structured data, audio, images, video. And deep, le deep learning on graph structured data lagged for years because the combinatorial complexity and nonlinearity issues uh, involved in graph structures created prohibitively long training times to iterate through uh, experiments and models on graphs of me any meaningful size and density. However, it's precisely the information hidden in all that complexity that makes graphs so interesting. So if we consider this model architecture, um, graph convolutional networks, which have made some big strides in the last couple of years, um, in a GCN, we're beginning with certain attributes to describe nodes and edges in a network, we then perform linear transformations on those attributes and aggregate that information by probing the neighborhood of each node in a sample selection. The idea behind sampling is that we don't want to have to uh, request information from every single node in a graph because there's some redundancy since these, graphs, since these nodes are all interconnected with one another. Uh, we then repeat the process just described over and over again to arrive at an embedding vector for each graph node. And this is what we call node embedding. So what is node embedding? Oh, actually, a uh, quick, quick uh, side note. This is uh, Thomas Kipp on the, on the right, uh, uh, published the uh, paper from the image that I just showed, a uh, very important paper on graph convolutional networks. The following year in the same conference, ICLR, my colleagues Jia Chen and Tang Fei Ma, pictured there next to me, um, uh, published a new method called FastGCN, which was an important scalability uh, step forward for this uh, model architecture. So what is node embedding? Um, it really is an existential question um, akin to the question of who am I? You know, this is a question of infinite complexity, but we need a vector of finite length for the model. Um, so in addition to the normal features about me that we're going to solicit, you know, that, that we're going to consider we're also going to consider the input from my neighbors in my network. And for those of you who like the math, you know, here is the basic equation, what I would call the, like the vanilla GCN or the classic GCN described by, by Kipf and Willing. H to the power of L on the right is the input node embedding matrix to update the output H to the power of L plus one on the left, left hand side. A hat is the normalization of the adjacency matrix A. Sigma is the activation function, which is typically ReLU for all but the output layer here. And uh, W to the power of L is the weight matrix. Now, in a paper called FastGCN, which I just uh, mentioned, um, they modify this equation 
uh, in a really elegant way to perform an integral transformation of the node embedding term in order to perform a Monte Carlo approximation. Um, and that, uh, combined with a, a different sampling method, allowed them to increase the speed without sacrificing accuracy by two orders of magnitude, which is a big step forward. Uh, that was two years ago, and, uh, and a lot of progress has been made since, and this is how research goes. Is the community is, is, uh, is contributing, and, and it's, it's, it's moving, frankly, at a, at a breakneck pace. So applications of graph learning are uh, where things really get exciting for real-world impact. You know, graphs, as I said, are everywhere. We can think about operations problems and supply chains. Um, the classic problem of the, the traveling salesman uh, has, has recently been addressed in a paper on uh, using GCNs. Um, molecular structure, so discovering new antibiotics and predicting antibiotic resistance. We have some recent work out of the MIT IBM lab uh, on this exact topic. Electronics de design, NVIDIA uh, has, has been using graph representations for, of logic circuits. And, and also, uh, and especially in finance, where so much uh, of finance comes down to relationships between things and understanding um, hidden patterns. Uh, and that's one of the uh, use cases that we're going to get into today. So anti-money laundering. Uh, this, is, uh, this is something that uh, some people never think about, uh, perhaps until the, this, uh, this new show Ozark came out uh, on Netflix. But it's a, it's a very, very big topic in the financial world, uh, both for uh, traditional finance and also for people who care a lot about financial inclusion and, and opportunities uh, uh, for, for those who are off, often on the margins of society. I'll get into that in a moment. But at, at the base level, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's the practice of hiding money from illicit activity uh, so that law enforcement authorities uh, uh, can't can't take it away and shut it down, and so uh, this is done through complex layering schemes and account schemes uh, in a global economy with complex complex uh, uh, rules and, sh and, and shifting regulations from country to country, and it's a very difficult thing to track, and and so increasingly we're looking at data science and AI to help us do this. Now, if we ask ourselves why this matters. Um, you know why money laundering matters. It's 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 it doesn't take long to see uh, the human effect of this beyond the compliance for the banks. Um, consider the fact that eight hundred thousand people are exported annually in a forty billion dollar human trafficking uh, industry, enslaving forty million people. I mean those those numbers are staggering, frankly. And um, how do you shut down a four billion forty billion dollar industry oppressing so many people? Well, that money has to move, and that money is laundered uh, every year so that uh, law enforcement th authorities can't track it down. And so whether it's drug cartels or terrorism or human trafficking, our hope is that with more advanced methods for uh, finding bad actors in our financial system, uh, we, we hope we can make an impact on real-world problems like this. There's a secondary problem that happens, and that's because we want to stop the, the bad guys and drug cartels and human trafficking, we end up uh, increasing the focus on, on uh, money laundering regulations. And this actually raises the barriers of entry to, uh, to the financial system, excluding oftentimes the poor uh, and, and immigrants. And the World Bank, in a, in a, in a report a few, several years ago now, uh, noted that uh, indeed these these regulations, overly cautious regulations, can have a, a, a very negative effect on on people on the margins. And if you consider how people uh, receive money in low and in middle income countries, for example, from family and friends sending money from abroad where they where they have uh, uh, more productive work and can can get more income. Uh, it, it actually dwarfs the amount of global aid sent every year. So on the right-hand column, you see the amount sent in remittances versus the left-hand column, you see the amount sent in global aid. Um, so it's a massive, massive amount of money. And uh, best estimate is that about $37 billion in, in, in uh, money is, uh, is, is being spent on fee transaction fees to send money across borders, $37 billion. Uh, so, and, and a big part of that is the fixed cost of anti-money laundering built in uh, to this system. Um, 
if we think about AML as a graph problem, um, it emerges uh, as an opportunity to think about things like graph deep learning. So Joe Lowe here on the right uh, is the alleged uh, mastermind behind uh, one of the most massive money laundering schemes in history, uh, which allegedly uh, financed the Wolf of Wall Street, quite ironically. And if you look at this money laundering scheme, it's very intuitive. It's a graph. It's a graph problem. It's a relationships between all these people and all these different accounts and accounts that seem to have dead ends but really have re hidden relationships to other accounts, um, transactions that uh, were, were flagged in a rules-based system but may be suppressed. Um, it's a very interesting and complicated uh, uh, topic and one that is uh, attuned to the, to the types of methods that we're developing. So last year we published a, a paper, Anti-Money Laundering in Bitcoin, Experimenting with Graph Convolutional Networks for Financial Forensics. We use Bitcoin data because it's very difficult to uh, access uh, real-world financial data. And the data that we were able to access was actually really interesting because it was, it was curated by a forensic analytics company called Elliptic. Um, who has since opened, you know, made that d uh, data available on, uh, on Kaggle. Uh, we published this in the KDD workshop on anomaly detection and finance, presented it to the SEC and other authorities, and, uh, and I'll show you the results today. So we begin with the elliptic data set. This is a, a data set of about 200,000 node transactions. Bitco uh, the Bitcoin data set, the way Bitcoin is structured as a system, um, it made sense to, to actually uh, model each node, build the graph in, so that each node is actually a transaction and the edges map the flow of those transactions through the system. Um, it's an imbalanced data set, meaning uh, only 2% of the, of the node transactions are labeled as illicit. Um, and we'll get into some of the implications of that in the experiments and interpreting results uh, momentarily. Um, the way that they discovered these was, you know, if, if there was a ransomware attack that said, you know, we, we're shutting down your systems until you pay money to this Bitcoin address, Elliptic would take that Bitcoin address and, uh, and, and label it as illicit. Um, and working with law enforcement and authorities and others, they felt that they, uh, you know, their business model is trying to uh, establish a ground truth of what's really happening, happening in Bitcoin at any given time. What's interesting is they uh, developed 94 local features and 72 one-hop aggregate features. So the AF, make a note of that because in, when we look at the results, the AF is what defines the handcrafted manual relational features. So um, rather than using a graph, uh, or the, you know, this can be used to construct a graph, but but it's there's there's a lot of relational information that's being handcrafted. That's really time-consuming. Uh, it can be anyway, um, and so that's one of the things that we're going to look at in our results is, is how do those, uh, how do those uh, size up to other ways to extract relational information. Um, here's what the data set looks like over time. And in our experiment, so in the experiment we're going to do an imbalanced binary classification task targeting illicit transactions. Um, and uh, skipping ahead, one of the things that I really want to to focus on in, in evaluating the results is this precision, recall, and accuracy. So in times of coronavirus, for example, um, the, the most accurate model to predict whether or not somebody has coronavirus might actually be to predict that no one has it. Because, you know, especially early on, we might, we might say, uh, well, only X, you know, a small percentage of people have it, and therefore I'm going to predict no one has it, and you know, in a total accuracy sense, I'm going to be right. The problem is, is that especially at the beginning of a pandemic, you want to make sure that you're being uh, more, that you have a higher recall, meaning you're catching more, you're catching those cases so that action can be taken and that those cases don't propagate throughout the whole system. Uh, in which case uh, your accuracy will then later in time uh, wane. And so in the money laundering case, you have this difficult trade-off between precision and recall, where precision is basically don't exclude innocent people. Recall is let's make sure we catch all the bad guys. If recall is, is, it goes up to one, we are catching all the bad guys, but we're excluding a lot of innocent people and we're hurting a lot of innocent people. On the flip side, 
if we if we don't exclude any innocent people, then maybe we're not catching the bad guys. Um, and you can apply this to the quarantine, uh, quarantine no one versus quarantine everyone. And these are not easy decisions, but the, it, it's important as we interpret the results to think about these trade-offs and to see how different model architectures, um, how those trade-offs change across different model architectures. So how does GCN do? Um, it, it's very interesting. So there's two aspects of this. There's the aspect of the GCN node embeddings, that's the relational information, the a sense like the vectors that I was telling you about earlier. And then there's the classification task. What we find is that GCN does really well at extracting relational information. Um, and you see that um, in a number of different ways. But if you look at the F1 accuracy in pink on the right-hand column, you see that when node embeddings are used, um, uh, throughout different models, logistic regression, multi-layer perceptron, uh, and random forest, there's a boost um, across all models. There's a boost when we use the node embedding information from the GCN. Um, second, can we boost precision without sacrificing recall? Can we help more innocent people use the financial system without sacrificing the number of bad guys that we're catching? That's a really interesting question. It needs more study, but there are some really interesting results just in this preliminary data set, which is if you look at multi-layer perceptron in purple, for example, we have a massive boost in precision from 69% to 78%, and we don't lose a single uh, point on recall. And the to as a result, the total F1 accuracy goes up. That's very interesting. Uh, we see a different story in logistic regression a, and a similar story in random forest where we see a boost in precision without sacrificing recall in fact recall goes up and so uh, this the, the 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 classification the math behind the classification uh, is is an important part of this to consider and and is most likely where uh, is, is the topic of future study for us and lastly which model wins uh, the GCN boosted random forest does and um, this is interesting because if we think about logistic regression uh, and GCN in the in the in the classification layer, they're actually quite similar. GCN is essentially a non-trivial um, generalization of logistic regression, whereas random forest is with its ensemble method um, has a superior uh, classification task. And we do see, however, that when it is boosted with the node embeddings on top of the manually uh, manually provided uh, aggregate features from from the elliptic data set, uh, it does do uh, very very well. Um, at the moment in anti money laundering, much of the work is uh, is is actually rules based. Uh, much of the work is much of the many of the methods are rules based, and so uh, if we can apply any number of these methods or combinations of them. We do think that um, modern machine learning and, and, and deep learning methods uh, can be really powerful in helping us boost precision to help more people access the financial system, boost recall to help fight bad guys, and boost total overall accuracy uh, to help the system as a whole. Unfortunately, that's all that time I have today. Uh, I want to respect the, the conference. However, I would encourage you to check out this paper uh, that we published as a follow-up to this, which is Evolve GCN, uh, dealing with uh, graphs that are always growing, the temporal dynamism of a network, and how, uh, and, and how the system dynamics can be captured over time so that we can learn to predict black swan events, learn to predict uh, 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 behavioral changes over time to have more robust and hopefully more explainable uh, deep learning algorithms. So thank you. My name is Mark Weber. Uh, there's lots more to discuss on this topic, so I want to invite you to ask questions on Twitter. Uh, you can use my handle, Mark R. Weber, and the hashtag MITIBM. Uh, we also post our research on mitibm.mit.edu, uh, and uh, we have a whole bunch of new content out right now coinciding with the ICLR uh, conference this week. Thank you very much.